Okay, <laughs> this has gotten very confusing because um, I'm not sure exactly what segments are going to be in this week's podcast. Um, I'm trying to piece it together, and we're recording really late. Uh, in, like, in, in pieces. In pieces, and we've been interrupted a lot. We've broken up. Yeah. No, we didn't break up. <sighs> no, no. I actually have a beverage, which I never do either. I have coconut milk hot chocolate. Yeah, I started mixing drinks. Coconut <sighs> milk and cocoa. Yeah. Oh, man. So, uh, this is a topic that we have kicked around a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. I don't think we've unpacked it even together very much. No, but I, you have gone on some great uh, rants about it <laughs> that I've heard. Just, you know, here's the thing, if you're listening. Grace and I, like, every, like argument and debate and and topic we've put onto the podcast yeah for every one of those there's like three that we just we have it yeah we have, we have our own <laughs> discussion and they're not much different like no. we're talking politics when the kids are finally asleep at, you know one in the morning and i have to or get breakfast. up breakfast and i have to get up at seven and you know we're exhausted mm-hmm. we argue politics <laughs> yeah you know keeps the marriage healthy or um yeah, or at breakfast when I frantically need to get out the door yeah. because I'm really late for work. We are talk politics talk instead. Politics. <laughs> and stick your head back in the door. Wait, this just one other thing. One other point I have, have to, to make. make. <laughs> before I can leave. Yes. Oh, yeah, like that. So, but anyway, so this is a, a topic that, why don't you introduce it because I'm just wasting time here. That's fine. Not the time wasting, but I'll introduce it. So, um, there's a trio of schools in Ypsilanti, Michigan um, that are on the International Baccalaureate or IB track. Mm-hmm. The oldest of them is uh, called Y High, uh, which is uh, short for Washington International um, High School. And then there's um, WEMA, Washtenaw International Middle Academy. And then there's YIS. Ypsilanti International Elementary School. Ypsilanti starts with a Y, if you're not if you familiar yeah, so it's, yeah, yeah. with the area. Y-I-E-S. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and the deal is that the high school is an IB or Interlac- International Baccalaureate High School, and it is run by the county. And the county rents a school building from the Ypsilanti Community Schools. And the Ypsilanti Community School said, hey, this high school, people love this high school. And this school building is not full, and um, we could develop a a middle school program that's a feeder school for the high school for our students. And it would be um, a significant value to Ypsilanti students. Yep. And, um, And so they did. And so it was extremely popular. And so they said, hey, hey, let's develop an elementary school so we have a K through 12 system mm-hmm. that's um, robust and supported here in the community and um, available to Ypsilanti students. Yeah. Sounds good. <clears throat> Sounds great. It's, it's it, you know, it, and I'm not even a public school advocate, and I, you know, and I think it's good. Um, and, and this is what the Ypsilanti community schools decided to do with their tax dollars. And frankly, um, I am not intimately familiar with the development of Y High, the high school. I do know that it is located in a rent a building they're renting from the Ypsilanti to community schools that's in a very um, that's in the black neighborhood. And um, it's it's in the hood. There are a couple black neighborhoods in Ipsy. Yeah. And it's, it's sort of a black uh, housing area too. It kind of, yeah. Okay, and I'm, I still we haven't lived here that long, and we're not in downtown. No, no at all. Right so, the, the sticks, so we don't really know what that will look like. <clears throat> um, but I will say this much: um, the middle school, Wema, and the elementary school, guys, were funded, developed, and um, made possible by Ypsilanti Community Schools and Ypsilanti um, tax dollars. Um, they built those high schools, the, pardon me, they built the middle school and the elementary school from the ground up to really to try and rescue their school system, which is falling apart at mm-hmm. the seams. Yeah. Um, for lots of um, 
legacy reasons that I'm not going to unpack here yeah. and now. Um, but their school system's falling apart. This is their effort to rescue it, and it it's working! Yay! Woo! Ah! <laughs> <clears throat> now, interestingly enough, it seems that, and and I and I'm just gonna say it. I I don't think this is true. People keep saying this. Yeah. I, I don't think this is true. No one's showing me. I've not seen anywhere how it's true. Uh-huh. <clears throat> but the county keeps saying that to get certified as an international inter, international IB school, mm-hmm. that the middle school and the high school have to be the same entity. They have to. The, like same they had to, corp, the same uh, corporate entity. They have, they have to be the same corporate entity. They have to have the same administrative body and the same staff. And that it's more, and that it's more fit that in order to qualify, they have to do this and it's more efficient that way. Hmm. And so they said they approached this so the county approached uh, the Ypsilanti community schools and said, Hey, why don't we merge the middle school and the high school? They're in the same building anyway. Um, and we'll merge staff and everything, and it'll be, um, it'll be good. Mm-hmm. And Ypsilon is like, okay, so what would that look like? How would that merger take place? And the county says, well, we would take it over. <laughs> 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 and they're like, wait, what? <laughs> like, can you put, can you write that down? I'm just wondering. <laughs> uh, that was at a, that's an acquisition. <laughs> that's an acquisition, not, not, not a merger, merger right? <laughs> and so. This conversation's unfolding and happening. And the most recent thing is that uh, in October, the board voted 4-2 to two to go forward with this quote-unquote merger. Hmm. And the board president and one other person, another dissenting <clears throat> vote, was like, you know, we actually haven't seen much documentation for any of this. Yeah. Um, I suppose we can move forward with it. And the vote carried, but we actually don't have anything to we don't explain. Have a proposal. We don't like we like, have a proposal, but it's actually very vague. Yeah. Right. And again, again, I have to be it's clear. lacking a lot of detail. I, I don't. I don't really. I don't fully intend to call them bald faced liars. Mm-hmm. But I, I don't. I think they may have a misunderstanding if they honestly believe that it's required. Because you can have an international baccalaureate high school that has no middle school. Sure. So, I, yeah. so I'm not sure how there's this thing that it's actually it's required that the middle school and the high school have to be the same entity in order to be an IB school. No. Yeah. I, I, I just, I, not, I think, I don't, a, I don't think that's I, accurate. I'm not an expert on that subject. So. I'm, I, you know what? And I will confess, I am not actually an expert on that subject myself. But I have heard of this before and read about it before. Yeah. And, um, it sounds a little dicey. It just that sounds dicey. It sounds like somebody's misinformed in some way. Mm-hmm. Or they have an, uh, an extra agenda. I don't. <gasps> <laughs> anyway. No. Do you think people are gambling in this establishment? <laughs> <laughs> I just, <coughs> I was okay, just right. bragging about how I got through the whole last segment without coughing. coughing but, but anyway, yeah, here we are. Go on. So anyway, so that's that's where it's at right now. They've taken a formal vote to move forward with a merger, and um, now, mind you, the the city concerns, Ypsilanti's concerns, are that um, the middle school right now, as an Ypsilanti community school, is populated mostly with Ypsilanti students. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> Go figure. And that if they hand it over to the county, then it it wouldn't be. Yeah. Right. And then they that there would necessarily be Ypsilanti students displaced from this middle school Hmm. and then similarly and then the other issue is that this county show no interest in the elementary school however and people typically don't want to uh, bust their elementary school students no one likes that yeah right i mean we can talk about busing separately but historically no one's liked busing elementary school students i didn't like being bused i didn't like being (laughs) bused elementary school right so that that said that aside um the other nice thing is that Yais was ac- was actually was literally a feeder for Wima. That mm. every student that went to the elementary school had a slot guaranteed for them in the middle school. Yeah, whether they d- took advantage of it or, or not. not is another thing. But <clears throat> there's a spot for them mm-hmm. once they enter kindergarten. There's a spot for them through the end of middle school, and then and the negotiating and the the understanding and the expectation and what had been developing was that. All the middle school students would then also have a spot in the high school. Sounds sounds good. Sounds all good. Now, yeah. 
with this shift. Now, now here's the other thing. I would feel it was much more benign, except they started threatening them when they said, like, wait, what do you mean, like, acquisition, not merger? What, is that, what are you talking about? And they're mm-hmm. like, well, you know, we could move to Selene. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just putting that out there. You know, we could just take the whole thing. We could take a ball and go home. Then what are you going to do? You know? mm. <laughs> so, so with the threat on the table that they would move the high school and lose the city, the city would lose this lease. Yeah, they'd moved the high school to Saline, and then they're just sitting there then, with the middle school and the elementary school, and no, <laughs> and no high school for those students to move it's to. Feed, no, it's not a part of a feeder. It's not part of a feeder system anymore. Now they've got this hole in their system, and again they've got to rebuild the high school from the ground up. Mm -hmm. So either they give away the middle school they've built. (laughs) Yeah. Or they build a high school. (laughs) Right. And when I say build, I don't mean to build the physical infrastructure. I mean, all the, all the curriculum and staffing and administrative pieces to bring a school to existence. They have a building. They have, they have, they have swimming in buildings. Yeah. They're trying to rent all these buildings out. Um, It's not about, uh, it's not about building the space. Building, uh, space. They got plenty of space. It, it's about the the um, I want to call it soft infrastructure of all the people and the administration yeah, and which the we curriculum. shouldn't overlook how no. expensive and how long it takes to build up a good staff and a good, a good team and group. No, it, it's that's that's where it's years companies the think they can just move. They think their location is fungible. No, it's not. It never is, and no. neither is there. Staff, you know, just like having a bad staff can doom a team, a, even one bad person one can bad doom person a team. team. Having a couple, you know, a few really good players can guarantee, can guarantee. That, that the team works. Right. So, so either they give up the middle school they built or they build a high school to ensure this continuity for their students. <clears throat> yeah. So now it seems like now that the proposal's actually like taking shape on paper Mm -hmm. so first off they actually do want to move both the high school and the middle school to another location Ypsilanti in the white part of town Um, so actually they want to do that right away yeah and And someone's going to have to uh, some students are going to have to be disrupted however this this whatever plan happens and and, you know, there's plenty of space in these buildings. There, there should be plenty of space for all the Ypsilanti students that want to attend. Mm-hmm. Now, mind you, that's not actually the same as um, as, as a guaranteed space. Right. That's, I mean, right. like, so the rhetorical frame has shifted to, well, there's, like, space in the building if they want to go there, right? Mm-hmm. From, we are building guaranteed this school a slot from guaranteed with a, a, slot. Slot, a guaranteed yeah. slot for any student in Ypsilanti that wants to attend. Mm-hmm. Uh, pardon me. Any student in Ipsy who's in the feeder system has a spot in the system. Yes, yeah. that's different than there's space in the building for you. If you like, sure. I mean, I suppose I could go sit there in the building if I wanted to, right? <laughs> but um, it, it so it's kind of and it's kind of this sort of doe-eyed. Well, yeah, there's space for it, you know, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know why they're concerned. I, you know, um, or like why you know why this is a thing, but. Uh, <clears throat> The other reality is that that now sort of leaves the elementary school orphaned. Mm-hmm. And what it also means that if it's a county school is that the county gets those dollars, 95% of them, and the Ypsilanti Community Schools does not, only gets 5% of the dollars mm-hmm. for the students of their homes that are coming from their district to the county school. Um, so you, so wherever they go, you're right, it's, whether it's in Salina or whether it's here, it's, it's a shift in funding for Ypsilanti. Yeah. They still have a lease on one of their buildings, right? Mm. And that doesn't go away. But um, it's a net loss for the Ypsilanti community. Yes. For the city, specifically. And Ypsilanti is not in a position to absorb to a lot losses. more losses. <laughs> Ypsilanti is not in a position to sustain no, any losses. No, um, it's They're overstuffed with uh, low-income residents who have fled from the places they can't afford to live yeah and as a result they have a, a problem with their tax base yeah which is now a structural problem it's a structural problem yeah and the it's the it's deeper than that in there's all these sort of really basic infrastructure mandates that it's the city's job to yeah. take care of yeah and they have to pay for that somehow right 
and the way they pay for that is tax dollars. I mean, and that's why, and that's why this international village thing, mm-hmm. the, this other thing, yes, it's a very international theme going on here. But anyway, right. Um, uh, was we, it a boondoggle? Yeah, we should mention the 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 latest reports we've heard, the latest news stories about that international village it's are are that it's not happening, that they Which, can't, that the the person who claimed to be the real estate developers, it's all developer kind of isn't really qualified and can't do what she can't claims, deliver. can't deliver. Uh, so who, who anyway. knows what? Yeah, what else? But is it fall, seems but. seems like that sort of. Just uh, falling into obscurity, right? Which, and honestly, it, it richly deserved to do. Yeah, I think I think Ipsy's dodged a bullet. <clears throat> yes, but um, anyway, there's there are lots of structural financial problems that the city is trying to mount, and one of them is the sort of chicken and egg problem of a school system. That it, well, if you don't have a good school system, people don't want to live there. <laughs> yeah, and but if people don't live there, you can't build a good school system. Right, and so they're constantly trying to crack this nut of having a stable functional populated k-12 through school system the idea being that people who actually are high enough income to have a choice where they live right won't automatically avoid it in favor of ann arbor schools or celine or yeah. wherever yeah or even Milan for crying out loud yeah right so um so that that's been a nut that the city's been trying to crack um, and and now it looks like their elementary school that they just fit. I think they just opened it. That this is like its second year, and it's doubled their student body in this first year. And like so, from year one to year two, boom, it's really growing. And now it's kind of orphaned without a a, a track, a gate right. twelve track to move the children through. And people don't want to put their kids in a school that doesn't have a clear path clear to the next goal. grade, right? Because you know, it's for disruptive. one reason they. Develop friendships, right? And right. then they're all going to be scattered. Nobody knows if they're going to be together the, in future years. Right. It's very disruptive. And, um, well, anyway, it's the situation that that ypsilon has got here, where they're trying to call us together. And so the county's kind of basically swooped in and taken all of their um, strategic planning, mm-hmm. all their dollars that they've invested. When It's a significant investment to get this off the ground. And they're just taking it. I don't think they're actually going to pay them for it. The guy's just going to take it. That <laughs> and, seems wrong somehow. And let's and let's be very clear here. Yeah. Um, when the county takes it, the racial makeup of the student body is going to change. Yes. Yeah. And um, there are certain racial groups that will be losers in this transfer, <laughs> and there will other racial be other so, racial so groups wait, that are winners. Wait, wait. So will the wealthy white students be losing out? <laughs> Just no, not r- really. No. no, that's uh, that's. Uh, I know. I was shocked too. <laughs> I, I too was shocked by this revelation. <laughs> Gambling here, here, <laughs> like amongst us. You're winning, sir. You're winning, sir. Oh, sh- <laughs> <laughs> all this said. Um, I, so they're, they're a racial, but that part of it is actually, we like to pretend that's not happening. Yes. And when anyone mentions that there's like, there's this disparity, right? Yeah. That um, Yais and Wima are majority black schools. Uh-huh. And that Waihai um, is majority white. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there are, there are students of a variety of ethnic backgrounds at Waihai. Mm-hmm. And all the white parents describe it as integrated. Meaning it's about 10% black, right? Me- meaning it's about 20% non-white. Okay. Really. And uh, please, please correct me on my percentages if I'm... No, you know, I don't, I don't you know. know. I'm, I'm, I'm just I'm, guessing. So if white parents described it as well integrated, <laughs> it would be like... <laughs> there, there are a couple of non-black kids in the room, right? Yeah, it, w- it would be like... Or a, a couple of non-white kids in the room. Like a photograph of a, of, on a cover of a college brochure. Like a Benetton right, ad, right? Right, right. Right. Um, like whiteness is centered and, and there are like some other racist sprinkles amongst them. Yes. Right? Yeah, like uh, confetti. Like confetti. Or, uh, you know. Uh, sort of as flavoring, decoration, flavoring. if you will. <laughs> but, um, so many, many white parents 
describe it as well. It's a really integrated school. It's you know it's racially integrated. Mm. Um, it's gender gender integrated. It's everyone um, has their one black friend. It's uh, financially integrated. It's um, um, in many ways. Mm-hmm. It's an integrated environment, um, but it's not um, a majority non-white space. By any, you know what I'm saying? Right. By any stretch of the imagination. And so that's the county, and and it, it doesn't really look like the demographic of the city. That exactly, it's in. and in fairness, as a county school, it's open to anyone in the county, and that's a that's a more accurate reflection of the county. Of the county, yes, than of the city of Ypsilanti. Yeah, right. Yeah. Whereas the schools that are run by Ypsilanti community schools are a better reflection of Ypsilanti and less a reflection of the county. Mm-hmm. Right. So structurally and by definition. <clears throat> Any movement for it to be a county-run school is going to um, make it less reflect the Ypsilanti community. And the nut that I really want to just sort of pull open and reflect on here Mm -hmm. is this one piece that this is an investment that the community of Ypsilanti made Yes, that honestly they couldn't afford to make, but they had no choice. And now the county... Who can well afford to make this investment for themselves? Right, is taking it from them. Yes, and kind of muscling it away. That's not cool. That, that's, that's just not cool. Because if they wanted to have a middle school to partner with their high school to qualify for this IB thing, which I think is a fantasy, um, then they could have invested the dollars and developed that middle school and made that so. Mm-hmm. In fact, if that's true, they probably said, well, let Ypsilanti invest the money and then, you know, we can probably just take it away. (laughs) And if it's not true, it's just, you know, sort of this thing they're trying to use to muscle it away from them. Yeah. Um, So, frequently, people um, challenge me when I say that um, while I would easily and quickly agree that most of conservatism is rife with uh, uh, racism and um, um, and just general fuckery, you know. <laughs> well, I, just, I, I would it's just especially swimming the, in it, you know. Especially the the resurgence of nationalism, and, yeah, yeah, and opposition, and like um, define reli- the religious groups they support very narrowly and exclude yeah. even other Christians. You yeah, know? yeah, it's it's bizarre. Um, so I'm 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 quick to concede that and say that that's that's there, and that conservatism is deeply broken, and it needs a lot of help. Yeah. Um, but that said, on or similar to my pro-life convictions, I'm I'm not willing to abandon the term for myself. Conservative. Right. I'm not willing to jettison the term right. for myself. As screwed up as the term has become. Yeah. Well, I mean, I feel kind of the same way about liberal, and I feel that I've left that behind because it's become a toxic mess but when i point out to people that that um uh, liberals are pretty, pretty racist. racist they're pretty racist and in a and that is it's actually a more pernicious racism it's structural because it's structural and polite and very polite yeah and you can't actually pin it on them it like kind of slides always, off. it's like plausible deniability it's it's always a a policy issue that everyone knows is the right thing to do. Well, yeah. But you can't define why. Why? Yeah, it's not clear why, but this is the right thing to and do. And when you unpack it and look at who it benefits, <gasps> there oh look, that's look why. That. That's why. Um and <clears throat> so that's we're watching this unfold. We're watching yeah, some liberal yeah. some really fucked up liberal racism unfold right here right now. Yes. It's just kind of spilling out in front of us. Yeah. And the black people in the situation are kind of like, whoa, hey, how is this even happening? <laughs> and the white people are like, well, you know, um, there's plenty of room for you at the table. Everybody knows. Everybody knows. That this is the best solution. Right. And and by the way, if you don't comply, we'll have to leave. Yeah. <laughs> Et cetera, yeah. right? Yeah. We'll take our money. We'll take our money and go. Yeah. So... I just want to refer to an article here. There's Please. a Ypsilanti schools is to give up control of Washtenaw International Middle Academy. And um, the vote took place in October, vote, a vote 42, in favor of a resolution to move forward with consolidating 
consolidating. It's a nice sort of way of getting around the <laughs> acquisition merger. Right, right. right. It's a consolidation. They're, they're, they're turning into one thing, but we're not going to describe Just, how. To describe how. Two schools that currently share a building. Currently, they're in the same building. Uh, board President Sharon Lee said she and Trustee Brenda Meadows opposed the resolution, which was brought to the school board at Tuesday's special meeting. Treasurer Meredith Sindler was absent for the vote. And Lee said, I'm studying this myself. It, this was the first time I had seen the proposal. We didn't even get a chance to look it over and absorb it. To me, it just seems like we're giving up all the control right now. Now, um, so the, the Washington International High School is run by the Washington Educational Options Consortium, which is a group that runs schools that aren't local schools and they run them throughout the county. Mm-hmm. And I think they have they have three high schools that they run. Um, and the other high schools, you know, have support arrangements with them where like students will come and take classes there and things like that. Now, um, and the IB, the International Baccalaureate Curriculum, is centered on student inquiry and emphasizes global awareness. Now, and again... I should, I should just say some of my smartest friends... Went, went to, to IB, IB school. programs, right? No, they're they're widely recognized as strong educational programs. Yeah, yeah. Which is why the Ypsilanti Community Schools chose to develop a yeah. high school under the elementary school. They're basically doing an end run around No Child Left Behind standards yes. and saying we're going to go for something with real, with teeth. real teeth. Exactly. Um, and there's a gentleman that's uh, the board president of the Washtenaw, um, Washtenaw Educational Options Consortium, uh, Mr. Duggar, and um, he says the goal is to essentially maintain the program as it is in terms of being very much an Ypsilanti-based <clears throat> program, he said. We're really just sort of cleaning it up. <laughs> cleaning, cleaning it up. Yeah, because, you know, it's, it's kind of dirty. Interesting wording. Uh, crossing the T's, dotting the I's, so we can actually combine them in a way that is efficient and makes sense. Mm-hmm. And then the uh, the Washington board previously authorized Duggar to develop a consolidation proposal, negotiate the arrangement. And um, one of the school board trustees received the... One of the school board trustees initially received the proposal in May and has been waiting on in- updates from the superintendent. Um, and that's... One of the trustees that's sort of a booster or sort of a rah-rah for the mm-hmm. merger. And really for financial reasons because um, they're scared and they don't want to lose the program. Yeah. Right. Um, and um, and she mentioned specifically why I could move out of Ypsilanti altogether and take the Washtenaw Middle Academy with it to start an IB middle years program somewhere else. Uh-huh. And um, that could be bad. Um, and without their daily support, rebuilding the program couldn't happen. Mm-hmm. And if it did, or when it did, it would be a very long time before they could put something back together again. And part of the consolidation plan, the county is planning to relocate Y High and Rima to Ypsilanti's West Middle School on Mansfield Street. And and to be fair, um, Ypsilanti is a more racially integrated community than other parts of Washtenaw County. Yes. So anywhere in Ypsilanti is going to be uh, kind of, you know, it's going to be kind of the hood. But right. right now it's 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 in the hood. Yeah, yeah. Um, which benefits that neighborhood. Which benefits that neighborhood. Yes. Tremendously, right? Yes. <laughs> Tremendously. And so them leaving is already, <laughs> already it's going to be a blow to Ypsilanti neighborhood. You're punishing the punished. Right, already. Yeah, yeah. Day one. The proposal is to punish the neighborhood yes. right out of the gate. Yes. Because they need more space. They need a bigger <laughs> building, you know. I mean, there's so many kids, you know. We can't guarantee a space for these kids unless, you know. Actually, they already have a space guaranteed. I'm just saying. <laughs> um, yes. So part of the consolidation, there, there just offers more space for the IB school's growing enrollment. Other specifics of the consolidation, um, staffing, transportation, still being negotiated. And um, both entities will need to sign off on the final addendum of the agreement. And the county is very excited at this point. And they can move forward. And um, I think it's a fantastic example. It's a fantastic example 
of how we do things very different in this county. <laughs> I think he's right on that. I think wow. he's spot on. I think that's exactly it's, right. You know, <laughs> we think innovatively and we think collaboratively. <laughs> and this is a great way to provide a fantastic educational option for students at Ypsilanti while partnering with the community. Could they say? Would they say colonially? No, no, collaborative. <laughs> oh, collaborative. Co- sorry. Oh, collaborative. I was I was like a Freudian slip. I'm I- sorry. Imperially. Imperial. <laughs> collaboration. Like, you know, oh, collaborators okay. collaborating. I see. Okay. I see. Yeah. Um, with the occupying regime. Um, <clears throat> now, students in all county programs are still counted in their home district and that determines how much state funding the school district receives. This is the 95 5 thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and why I currently enroll students from all across Washington County. And each school district reserves a certain number of seats for their students for their each year. Now, um, the resolution passed by YCS calls for WEMA to continue enrolling mostly Ipsy students, even after it becomes a county program. Mm-hmm. The resolution says Ypsilanti students will account for 95% of WEMA for the next three years. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So now that it's was, gonna so it's gonna be a sunset town basically. What? <laughs> what? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is, and they're planning it this way, but they're not racist or that's anything. So, so everyone who who still needs to graduate <laughs> doesn't have to change. Doesn't, doesn't have, have to drop sh- out. Drop right? out. <laughs> so the kids that are there can actually finish, and then they, we'll, then they'll be replaced by white kids. D- yeah, yeah. We're not gonna like throw you out the door today wow yeah just like none of your kid, like your kid brother can't come <laughs> just okay <laughs> just understand yeah that like your younger siblings can't be here i right. mean okay you're already here that's fine but like no more of your people can come here yes all right because you know we do things differently <laughs> in this county <laughs> there's a way we do things here and this isn't it wow. we need to clean this up a little bit <laughs> Now, this was always the intent. That's in the proposal. The other superintendents in the county certainly understand that. Mm-hmm. That going in, these mm-hmm. kids are going to be here, and then we're going to phase them out. We all understand that reality. Yeah, yeah. He also said there should be enough space at Weimar to accommodate students advancing from... I- there should be enough space at Weimar to accommodate students advancing from Yais. Um, and... Students coming from Yais previously were guaranteed to see it at Lima, but now they'll have to apply. And unless Yais classes double in the next few years, Lima and Wanghai should be able to accommodate those students who want to continue. Because. <laughs> unless. Well, first of all, they actually already have doubled. Yes. And seem to be on track to double. Wasn't that the, the, the last words of the Lorax before he left? <laughs> unless. Unless. If something happens, I know. <laughs> It's hard to know what could happen. I mean, I can't predict the future. Yeah. Um, so this is actually a textbook example of the way liberals steal wealth from black communities. Yes. Yeah. And so the investment that Ypsilanti made no longer belongs to Ypsilanti or its children. And <clears throat> liberals will wring what their little, hands what little and it, tut wealth tut. they develop. What little tiny little Which scrap honestly was of developed more by the work of the people there than by right. the funding. What they had. They yes. had labor. They didn't have yes. money. Yes. So they used that. And yeah. they made something. And now rich people are going to take it. Yes. And then tut tut, like, oh, things aren't working out over there. I wonder what's going on. Like, do you think it could be like their culture or something? I, I'm just wondering. Like, what could be going on? They're not on? getting along with this sudden influx of uh, new students. Yeah, I'm not sure what that's about. That's weird. Um, You'll hear about the, you know, the, or just how the, it was kind of dirty. The in the guy's locker and the, you know, the like who did that? That's not the kind of community we are. Yeah. And I don't know if you go around stealing things from poor people. That is the kind of community you are. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly the kind of community you are. <laughs> if you steal things from poor people, right? There's really no other way to like explain that or describe that. Or to understand that. And I'm sure no one at the county thinks they're stealing something from poor people. They <laughs> Or frames that in any way like that. They don't use those words. No, they don't use those words. But they, the fact that they feel good about it probably says a lot. 
It really does. So it really does. So it's disgusting. It's revolting. And again, it's hard to hang uh, a sign on this as the racism that it is because no one said nigger. Exactly. No one said anything like that it's, at all. Yeah. No. It's and it's, these people, they never would. It's fully a, a piece of structural institutional racism. And I think it's very telling that this is the way things are done here. Yeah. That, it really is. That, that wording. Right. So, you know, and I think the closest, the very closest he came to betraying the nature of what's happening here is discussing cleaning the program cleaning up. Cleaning it up. Like, yeah, successful. Like, was it dirty? I mean, was it, <laughs> if something was a mess or was it, was there a problem that we didn't know it's about? It's kind of dark in the car. It's a little dark in the car here, you know? You can get some lights on. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, so it's full of Canadians. It's full of Canadians. Damn, that was the Canadians are everywhere you go. You know. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's that's just an example, and if if you know if you're a liberal and maybe you're listening to this, and you're like, I don't know, that doesn't seem that racist to me or whatever. Um, I suppose I can unpack this more. I'm, I welcome your questions. I welcome your your um, perspectives on why and how this might not be a racist thing. Or maybe there's maybe something else we're misunderstanding. Yeah, maybe I'm misunderstanding completely. Maybe in fact, actually, they built an international baccalaureate high school that couldn't get certified in any way unless they stole a middle school from somebody. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's what they did. I don't know. So maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the high school is considerably more integrated than I realize. Maybe I don't know. I wonder if we can. I'm curious if we can get a get a guest on to talk uh, I wonder. about this i don't know i'm kind of well i'm kind of mean or people think i'm mean anyway. <laughs> so they may not want to talk to me but that's yeah yeah, yeah. but you know I'm, I'm not actually mean no you'll be very polite you'll be very polite yeah i probably won't even swear offer a cup of tea yeah yeah now we we haven't figured out technically quite how we're going to do guests, do guests but we gotta we gotta get gotta get a gotta guest. get our game together up our game and start yeah. having Having guests to talk about things like this, and so oh oh I know there's one thing I do want to I do want to respond to before I hear it. Um, there's a sort of thing people are like, well, that's not like lynching a man. <laughs> that's no, like, it's you like know, it's not like lynching. a it's man. It's like giving rope burns to a hundred men instead. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's oh, that's so terrible. But um, yes, and. Um, I think it's disingenuous to say that's not like lynching a man. Yeah. Well, okay. Give me your... I mean, I I, I think that's true. Right? I'm not... It's very much like giving rope burns to a hundred men instead. Mm-hmm. And then saying, well, I'm not as bad as the guy that, you know... The lynched one of the them. The lynched one, you yeah. know. As if, like, because it's different, it's not as bad. To, you know, like you're less racist. It's like racist. It's like racism light. Racism light. light. So, therefore... You shouldn't be mad about it or something. I, I'm not, that's a kind of perverse thing all to itself. Yeah. And I see a lot of that. But a lot of people are like, well, because it's not an open lynching, because it's not beating a man in the street and calling him names, that's not really racism. Yeah, just to be clear where I am, I don't just want to see programs that treat minorities equally. Yeah, no. I want to see programs and plans that explicitly benefit the most disadvantaged first. First. First in line. Yes. Right. And you can say, well, that's affirmative action. That's, you know. Call it whatever you need that's to. That's hardly fair. That's not the American way. This is a meritocracy yeah, no. or whatever. No. No, it's not the American I, way. I, I want to see reparations. I want to see reparations, actually. <laughs> yes. So... So that's part of it, but th- this, I'm, I'm addressing this, this other frame that, well, that's not even like like racism. That's okay. just like how politics works, and it's yeah. unfortunate, and there it is. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the weak tend to be on the losing end, and blah, blah, blah. That's just how politics works, right? Yes. Um, this is a specific thing that liberals are comfortable with and actually like because it benefits them. Yes. Um, and their stock portfolios and their way of life and the way they've structured their worlds and their families. Mm-hmm. So you like it. You like it when the lynching happens by the police in their neighborhood. 
Yes. Yeah. And you can pretend that maybe it's because this guy was like a drug monster. Yeah, or he didn't comply fast enough. He didn't enough, comply fast and enough. And he should have known better. Whatever, you know. He his parents should have taught him how to be deferential to the police. And, and so on. And I use it. Now it's become a, a liberal thing. Like This is like in the last three or four years. It's become sort of a reflexive liberal thing to feign some kind of uh, support for Black Lives Matter, right? Yes, yes. And, and so you'll see less of this sort of telegraphing of this view that it's actually it's fine if the police shoot a guy in his neighborhood. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. fine. That's crime prevention. That's, um, you know, drugs are bad and we got to take care of that and I'm not sure if we should legalize marijuana and all that. Yes. That's actually part of this. That these things are actually connected mm. because there's if there's no functional school system in that neighborhood. Yes. There's only a few other places the kids can go. Right. And we've created a police state to come and preferentially police those neighborhoods. I want you to notice that in the neighborhoods where the poor people live, there are cameras at the stoplights to catch them and find them for running a stoplight. There are no cameras in the neighborhoods where I live, in the neighborhoods right. where people with money live. Yes. There's not an organized ring to to steal what little they have. To steal what little they have. Yeah. yeah. Those cameras are in the poor neighborhoods. Yep. The police presence is in the poor neighborhoods. And if the children aren't in some kind of managed environment that the community has created for them, mm-hmm. then they are left They're to tender mercies. To all this. Yes. To all of the police state. Yeah. Right? And those things are actually intimately connected. And so, in effect, when you say we're going to take your children's school that they can walk to from them, you are saying we're now going to leave your 12-year-old boys exposed to a lynching. Mm-hmm. That's what you're saying. A legal, legal A legal lynching. state-sanctioned lynching. Yeah. That's what's happening. I mean, he was, he and, was carrying an Arizona iced tea. I know. What, what was I supposed to think? <sighs> right? So, but no, seriously, they are not A, B connected, right? It's not like, therefore, there's only one thing that can happen. Right. But... Um, We've set up the system that works this that way. That draws a line. That and draws, draws a line this way. Yes. Right? Yeah. And so when the community cannot create for its children any safe space, you have left those children at the mercy of the police state. And this and the safe space was something that the community built. Built. So it's not it's so it's even deeper and more pernicious and more ugly yes. than just taking away yeah. their labor. Yeah. And their own personal investment. It's and, actually and now for them to attend school, they've got to be bust. Be bust, be this, to, be that. They've got to wait at bus stops. They've maybe not get, get in. Get rides, maybe not get in. Lose maybe, those friendships, lose yeah, that social net. Lose the social safety net they've been developing. And and that's the how this works. That's how this, that's how this works. The possible so job connections. You can say to yourself that, well, this isn't the like guide, a lynching. Access to guidance counselors, you know. All those resources. Yes. Right? Yeah. And so you can pretend to yourself that this isn't like actually like a lynching or something. No, you've just sanitized the lynching. That's all that's happened. Mm-hmm. It very much is. It's just been sanitized so you can stomach it yeah. and have plausible deniability about your involvement in it. And you can pretend that, oh, well, you know, it wasn't like I, I didn't go to the lynching. This was like a police misconduct thing. And, you right, know, right. and that police officer is personally responsible for that. I mean, it's not like something I did. Black community tries to build something up themselves because, you know, to compensate for the lack of everything. Lack of everything. Uh, and, you know, you just casually pull the rug out from under it and be like, oh, shit happens. You know, that's politics. It's because it's of there's a technical uh, requirement. Technical that, requirement. Yeah. And, and seriously, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, and I'm personally of the... Personally, I'm of the frame of mind that if I had been on the school board, I would have been like, well, hell, take your damn school. We'll see ya. Yeah. <laughs> take your school. Yeah. Go on. Because, you know, why don't you guys go build a middle school for yourselves? Yes. You know, invest that money and build the middle school you need. Yeah. Have a nice day. Yeah. Um, I fully understand the sort of, uh, the very real fear that people have, like, oh, my God, where are we going to have our, send our eighth graders next year if right. they leave? Right. How are we going to even do this? I, right. I, I get that. Um. And it's that's probably the reason I'm not on a school board somewhere. It's well, it, yeah. <laughs> it's because I would it's, tell people to go I'm, to hell every day. But 
but yeah, it is. I mean, we would be trying not to disrupt our students. Yeah, yeah. totally. We'd be. So. Yeah, you know, we don't like to disrupt our kids. And you know, that's we've seen what happens when you right. do. So the the uh, preschool we were hoping to send our kids to kindergarten. Good. Yeah, shut down. The down moved. Yeah. Well, and and more more than that, I was hoping to send our other soon to be preschools to that preschool to the same preschool. The same preschool. Because I'm we not like the teachers yeah. it was close by it was a great program it was a great program we saw benefits in the kids behavior and learning and and their connections they were making with other catholic kids yeah. right yeah um and i i really wouldn't send a child, a child to school past kindergarten it's i, I think it's just uh, child, abuse. child abuse but uh but the preschool and kindergarten yeah. programs are usually very good in a montessori setting and um and and many Montessori elementary and high schools are very good, but um in that it wasn't going to be Montessori past kindergarten there, so I was hoping to have a spot for our children that were still in the, in the appropriate age range, yeah. and they just packed it up, moved it on. Kind yeah, of, yeah, yeah. It was not. It wasn't the good. same kind of situation. No, not by a long shot. I not mean, that shot. parish closed, but the, yeah, the parish effectively closed. It was taken over, yeah. and merged, and this and that. But um, my uh, I have a liberal friend who's who's literally writing posts now because she's hearing from her kids about how they're constantly bullied and yeah. she's saying but they have a zero tolerance for bullying program how can this happen because that's what happens <laughs> I, I, I i don't know how to explain this to you but yeah. i guess I, I hear that some kids don't get bullied i i hear that that happens that I, happens too i'm really scratching my head as to how this it's, it's not like, confusing because like, there are bulliers, there are their accomplices, and then there are the kids that get bullied. Mm-hmm. So by definition, there are some kids that aren't being bullied. Oh, I see what you're saying. Right. <laughs> so, I, you know, because well, I I was I was bullied and a bully. Oh. You know, because there's always there's almost always someone lower on the totem lower pole. on the totem pole than you are. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't know tried to make myself feel better from being beat up and tormented by tormenting other kids. I I guess people feared repercussions for beating me up or something. I don't know. <laughs> but um uh your uh, your uh your father was a, a a local person of some note. Yeah, of some repute. Yeah. Um but yeah, no, I would usually just call bullies on there. Like, hey, you want to go? <laughs> I'm right here, and that usually cut it off. But I think that was actually forces outside of my control at the time. I was always told to fight back, and I had to stand up and fight with bullies, and I did. That, that didn't really it didn't end really work it. out well. For yeah, you. the 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 theoretical thing is that oh, you punch a bully in the nose once, and you realize just how they they realize that they can't pick on you anymore because they're actually terrified of being beaten up i did hit bullies back it yeah, didn't work didn't work I, I i don't know actually that violence is really where we want to <laughs> it's really the solution we want to teach our children right that's that was no that was the advice i got from every adult in my life yeah yeah and and the after school specials or whatever you yeah know? i know so but there's I don't know that I'm really looking to do a whole episode of no, bullying, no, but no. I do want to say that there's this dynamic that we say play out in our day-to-day lives, and this is where children are trained in the dynamic, <laughs> okay? Well, it starts at home. That is, it really starts early. This this thing we see of bullying in schools and in these yeah, certain social yeah. settings. Yeah, is, how do we deal with bullying in homeschool? In homeschool, what's that about? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's a good question, right. but that's that larger issue. Um, we need to stop pretending that bullying is like some strange school thing. Right. It's like this social phenomenon that we have. Well, it seems like we're seeing a large scale version of school bullying playing out here. We really are. Well, and the, the, there's an article I posted a little while back um, where they talked about. Um, sharing social capital actually seems to undercut bullying. And and that's what I think is my strategy for an effective end game around it. Sharing social capital as in an integrated community school. For, for example, right? Yeah. Uh, and also, it, while I, my personal approach 
as a teenager and as a middle schooler was um, to be confrontational and to invite people to go ahead and make good on their threats. <laughs> um, and and it, it did sort of take the wind out of people's sails. Yeah. Um, I, you have to be have a certain place in the pecking order for that to work. Right. It didn't work for me. Right. And, it, and it's not, and really, so it's not really a solution exactly, right? But this concept of social capital is that a child who is bright and vivacious and fun can be made into a social pariah simply by being the new kid that no one wants to sit sure, with. Sure, sure. That that alone turns right. this child into pariah. And then it's a, a self-reinforcing positive feedback loop. Yes. Whereas if one or two people sit with the child and welcome the child into their social circle, social, I can't even say it, social circle, then... Tongue twister, tongue <laughs> she sells she sells that alone is enough to give it the the new child one of social capital to function mm-hmm. right and then to share with others and so on but other children see and are terrified of losing their social capital by being associated with the pariah yeah i i always kind of uh was happy to share what little social capital I have. So I would always actually seek out the losers and the, yeah, I know. you know, <laughs> gotta love the losers so much. Um, <laughs> or so, weirdos, I guess. Well, uh, the losers, weirdos. I mean, everyone called them losers. That's yeah. The, the people who seem more interesting than the, the a hell of a lot more interesting yes. than the cheerleaders. But, yeah. um, uh, that said, uh, we're going to get email from angry cheerleaders. Angry cheerleaders now. Um, bring it. The um, We welcome your, your hate. Welcome your hate. It's okay. Uh, but sharing the social capital is what actually changes the dynamic. Hmm. And it is people's terror about sharing social capital, about being associated with the pariah and losing social capital that could leave them on the short of the stick for the bullying. Yes. Because even nine-year-olds intimately understand what's at stake here. Yeah, yeah. And and this was the most terrifying part of the article for me. Apparently, parents teach their kids not to step in if they see somebody being bullied and not to share their social capital. Well, sure, sure. That's like the most horrifying thing I've ever read in my life. I, honestly, it is. It's just horrifying. That the people are at home and they say this to their children. <laughs> and they say things like this, like, whatever you do, you know. Don't help the vulnerable. <laughs> I don't know that I, I don't remember any advice on helping or not helping the vulnerable, sticking up for the vulnerable outside of Sunday school. But I mean, like practical advice for dealing with school situations. I, I'm, but actually, I'm my parents sure. are pretty explicit that if you really? see someone being being beat down or hurt yeah. or something, okay, you, you you know, help the person being hurt. I don't know that that issue ever came up because I was usually the one being, being beat down. Being hurt. Yeah. Well, I, well, not not just in that respect, but like, the, my parents were very explicit about if you see something happening that's unfair. Yeah, all right. You got to do something about that, even if it's just to call it out. You have to do something. Hmm. Um, that you have a you have a personal and a moral responsibility to do something about that. But this didn't. Then like, that was explicit. Be- become your lifelong. Uh- <laughs> Values, right? <laughs> it's just what my parents said. You know, yeah, it's just some it's just random some, stuff my parents random. said. <laughs> yeah, for example, right? But so it was always obvious to me that if someone was like being left out for no reason or for, I don't know, because they were ugly or whatever it was, mm-hmm. um, that, you know, they have a ride with me. You know, they have a seat with me. They have a place at my table. Um, and if someone was being picked on, somebody needed to say something i would say something and really and if teachers and actually this is why i kept getting into it with my teacher my bi- first uh freshman year biology teacher mm-hmm. is there were kids that she would kind of pick on and make fun of and i also in a middle school social studies teacher would pick on people i'd say you know it's not nice to call people names and <laughs> it was, she would be really mad about that <laughs> <laughs> i would and i would say you know it's not nice to call people names you shouldn't do that yeah um and then you'd wind up in detention. Then I'd wind up in detention, right? And um, truth to power, truth to power. So that kind of thing was something my parents explicitly taught me, and I understood that other students might be afraid to say something. Yeah, 
I just thought they weren't saying things because they weren't afraid. I had no idea their parents had told them not to say anything. <laughs> and I'm like, sure, okay, you know, maybe you're afraid to say something and maybe you don't want to go to detention and maybe you don't want the consequences of saying something. Yeah. I totally understand that. I get that. But I, it had never occurred to me until I read this article here in my 40s that maybe people were at home telling their kids not to help not someone to help in trouble. Each other. Don't, not help to, each other. don't help each other. Don't get involved. <laughs> don't get involved. Whatever you know. Just stand back, you know. Yeah. Well, just let him punch that kid. Don't you know, don't do anything. <laughs> like, what? Well, that's certainly what it felt like growing up. So that must that must have been there somewhere. So uh, apparently, yeah. apparently, I feel kind of almost like yeah. naive and childish to not have realized <laughs> this, right? <laughs> but I'd always just assumed that people were acting from their fear. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, I'm going to share this that, that article in the show notes as well. Yeah. So, so, um, so in case no one's mentioned it to you, if you see someone being hurt, you're supposed to do something. You're supposed to stand up for them. You're supposed to stand up for them. That's actually. If you your see job. someone taking away a kid's lunch money, or maybe their entire school, you should say something. <laughs> you should say something. <laughs> you should say something. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Next. I have another book that I finished that I want to talk about. Yay! At some length. <laughs> Paul wants to talk about a book at length? Wait a minute. That's What's weird. going on? <laughs> we got to get to the bottom of this. We got to put a stop to this until we can figure yeah, out what's, what's going on. What's happening? What's happening here? Uh, what book is this? This is a book. Hang on. This is a book I mentioned starting with the kids to read as a bedtime story. Oh, yeah. This is so it's a bit of a change of pace, you might say, but maybe it's not as much as one as it seems superficially. No. This is T. H. White's The Sword in the Stone. Oh yeah, yeah. That so was good. it is a story of Wart, who spoiler, <laughs> becomes King Arthur. So uh, this is an important book from my childhood. There are a mm-hmm. few books from my childhood that I remember as being really formative. Mm-hmm. And this is one of them. It's filled with anachronisms. It's hilarious, muddled, confused. Um, there's even, it lampshades all these things. It's almost like a series of sketches right. that often veer into high comedy or low, low comedy. comedy. A lot of low comedy. Yeah. And so uh, there's a, a scene where Merlin is arguing with whatever like spirit actually implements his magic and gives him things so he has the ability to like demand things Mm -hmm. and they're handed to him out of thin air right there's so so he has some kind of a a a, a spiritual creature or something that's like working for him trying to implement his demands and there's a scene where he's trying to get his hat and he winds up with all these different hats. Every he kept hat. saying, No, the other hat and he gets like a sailor hat. And they're all from the wrong time periods. Right. And so he actually he actually says, You know what this is? This is an anachronism. <laughs> this is a bloody <laughs> anachronism. anachronism. And it's like lampshading everything about how strange this is. Right. Right. Merlin lives backwards. So he's getting younger. I guess. And will one day be an infant. And will one day be an infant. Uh, but he, he like, uh, it's it's very confusing. It's inherently confusing. Yeah. But he gets younger, but he uh, he experiences. So on, on the day he meets Arthur, he's like, well, I guess we can say goodbye. <laughs> so, yep. And then, you know, but he also knows, he also has foresight and hindsight, and like foresight instead of hindsight. Okay. So he knows, he understands. That he's training King Arthur. Yeah. And he understands that his future self in his timeline was the person that took the young uh, infant Arthur away from Uther Pendragon and hid him mm-hmm. at the, for, uh, the, ca- the castle of the Forest Sauvage under the, uh, as uh, his foster father, King Ector. Right. And the foster brother, Kay. Mm-hmm. Right, uh, so he, he like knows things that it, it you know you you have to like draw diagrams to figure, diagrams out to figure out what's yeah, happening. I should say I I spent months and years poring over Greek and Roman myths and fantasies and tales and legends and mm-hmm. American tales and American legends mm-hmm. with my parents 
I mean, just at length. Yeah. The only English literature that we really did as a family was Beowulf. So I, I'm actually not you're, that. You're new to this. Uh, kind of. I mean, I, I mean, I've heard of King Arthur, right? Yeah. The Roundtable. I've heard yeah. of like the mythology, but I never read did it. You do the, did it. you do the Norse myths? Only in passing. Okay, because I was, you know, go figure, look at me in the mirror. But, like, I was really into the Norse myths. The Norse myths, yeah. I did study the Greek myths and all that on my own, but I I became particularly fascinated by American folklore, by Paul mm-hmm. Bunyan, mm-hmm. and also by the Norse myths. Mm-hmm. So we're doing a lot of reading of the Norse myths now, too. It's good stuff. Anyway, so... I, I wanted to be Merlin when I grew up, honestly. Oh, really? So yeah. he was my hero. Um, he's paradoxical. He says that he has j- been given just enough magic to help with Wart's education. So he's not allowed to turn K into things. Mm-hmm. So to, to explain, he turns Wart into various animals right. so that he has an experience uh, of a different culture, right. a different species. Uh, and different political paradigms. And different political paradigms. That's what's so fascinating about right. it. Um, Wart is, but it's kind of paradoxical because Wart is getting this special education because of who he will one day become. Right. But he presumably will one day become this person, at least we think for a while, because he's getting this special special education. education, Wait a minute. So which caused which? (laughs) Right, exactly. So it's like a, a causation paradox where something comes out of nowhere, which is a lot of time travel stories feature that kind of thing. Um, but Wart becomes king actually because Merlin, uh, traveling backwards in time, uh, ensures that he will be king. But we eventually learn that he is the biological son of Uther Pendragon. Uther Pendragon, right? So this is kind of ultimately like a, um, I guess biology is destiny after all. You know, divine right of kings. Sort of the hierarchy is engraved in blood. You know, the mm-hmm. uh, story, which is like okay, you can. But that's and Harry Potter is too to some extent, yes, right? Is. And so it's a British thing. It's really it's a British thing. It's culture. deeply embedded. Yeah, exactly. And th- I love authors who who subvert uh, that. who subvert that. Right. China Mieville, a Marxist science fiction writer, subverts literally that. a Marxist science fiction writer, subverts that big time, mm-hmm. and it's great. But I still grew up loving this story, so. Yeah. Um, White, meanwhile, he subverts this in many ways, partly with all these anachronisms. So um, a lot of places, the story is about different classes bumping against each other and living together. Mm -hmm. And in a broader culture, his version of the medieval uh, um, rural life, Mm -hmm. where there's a place for everyone. Yeah. And everyone is supported to one degree or another, another. By, by this system. By the system, right. Now, it's a little rose-colored glasses, but um, yeah. But we believe that, you know, we work harder than the peasants did, honestly. Yeah, we do. I'm not going to give, I'm not going to uh, mourn the fact that I have dental care. No. <laughs> and I didn't die of tooth decay when I was 10 years old. That was nice. Yeah. But, um, you know, even the the very debased and degraded people uh, the crazy people, mm-hmm. you know, they live with the dogs. They live with the dogs. They had some place to be. They had a job, yeah. you know, th- that they could do. Um, so yeah, there are some nice. great things about this book. King Pelinor is one of the funniest minor characters in the history of literature. I, I really believe that. <laughs> and he is played up in the uh, the adaptation of this book, which was Camelot. Mm-hmm. Right. Um Yes, yes. Or part of it. Mm-hmm. So uh, there's a speech by Merlin that really shaped my outlook on life. I like glommed onto this. I was probably in sixth grade or so, and I have to read this mm-hmm. this speech. Yeah, let's hear it. We hear the kids making noise up like, there. Are they having like a, it sounds like they're having a riot? A riot in Veronica's room. Cool. Okay. Yeah. This is a quiet riot. Quiet riot. <laughs> I saw them perform, you know, in the 80s. Yeah. You're bringing back bad memories. Bad memories. The best thing for being sad, replied Merlin, beginning to puff and blow. <laughs> so he's always deflating his uh, pomposity, right? Mm-hmm. Is to learn something. That is the only thing that never fails. You may grow old and trembling in your anatomies. 
You may lie awake at night listening to the disorder of your veins. You may miss your only love. You may see the world about you devastated by evil lunatics. Or know your honor trampled in the sewers of baser minds. There is only one thing for it, then, to learn. Learn why the world wags and what wags it. That is the only thing which the mind can never exhaust, never alienate, never be tortured by, never fear or distrust, and never dream of regretting. Learning is the thing for you. Look at what a lot of things there are to learn. Pure science, the only purity there is. You can learn astronomy in a lifetime, natural history in three, literature in six, and then after you have exhausted a milliard lifetimes in biology and medicine and theocriticism and geography and history and economics, why, you can start to make a cartwheel out of the appropriate wood or spend 50 years learning to begin to learn to beat your adversary at fencing. After that, you can start again on mathematics until it is time to learn to plow. Mm. So that really hit home for me. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to spend (laughs) a milliard lifetimes lifetimes. learning everything there was. It like clicked into my mind as a summary as, yes, that's who who I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. It's kind of... You know, sci- saying science, the only pure thing there is. Yeah, it's you, very 50s. You can, you know, you can pick that apart, that there's an ideology behind his mm-hmm. his words. I mean, well, he's got a very clear ideology in this book, right? Yeah. And it's very American. It's very um, mid-20th century. Um, and it's like, you know, his, his handprints are all over the page, all over the book, right? But um, some things are, are timeless and good. Yes. Yeah, some yeah. things are just timeless and good, there, regardless of where they came from. There's a story that also stuck with me. Uh, a character, a badger, tells uh, young Arthur, who has turned into a badger as well, mm-hmm. uh, about a paper he's writing. And it's a parable about how all the embryos mm-hmm. came before God on the like day before, last day of creation or day before the last day. And... They lined up to uh, ask God to shape them, mm-hmm. and and they could decide what kind of bodies they wanted. Mm-hmm. And so most of the creatures that came, all the all the creatures started out looking like plain, kind of embryos, right? right. He describes them as their little nodding heads and their arms folded over their bellies, right? Right, little distended bellies and nodding heads. Um, they came before God and said, here's what we'd like to be. And God said, the only rule is once you've decided, you can, there's no take backs. No take backs. And so the creatures became highly specialized. He describes a, a, a frog that lives in the desert who traded their entire body for blotting paper, right? They just, everything about their physiology is designed to retain, to soak up water and and mm-hmm. keep it so they can live in this dry environment. Okay. Talks about the badger that got like uh, rakes for hands, you mm-hmm. know, and, and uh, how all these creatures specialize. They develop like they got scissors for hands. They got like swords for arms. They got jaws that could crush bite and crush and, yeah. and bite and whatnot. And man is the last. And man says, uh, I'm not going to read the actual text, but man says, uh, actually, we may be really stupid for saying this, but um, we think that maybe you have a plan for us, and we would like to stay exactly as we are. And the idea is that hum- so the idea is that humans have basically retained their uh, unspecialization. Right. Or lack of specialization. Mm-hmm. Now, um, and God says, congratulations, you figured it out. As a result, we're going to give you dominion over all these creatures. Mm-hmm. And if you need something, some tool, you know, it's here. if you need to swim, if you need to fly, if you need to dig, if you need to shoot, if you need any of these things, you have what it takes to build those things. Right. Right. Uh, but what you're really specialized in is your mind, is your... Uh, 
your intellect. Your intellect. Yeah. So yeah. to me, this was like absolutely fascinating and it's sort of a short version of um, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, mm-hmm. which was a scientific idea yeah. years ago. Yeah. Now, it's not true, no. right? Humans are specialized. Highly specialized. Yes. Um, but it is true that embryos look alike, and one can imagine following the ontology recapitulates phylogeny argument that a lot of animals do specialize, and humans do seem superficially like they they don't, don't. Don't seem to have any special skill. Right. And it is true that we are lacking a lot of tools in our own body, right? right. That other animals have to survive. We're not very... Not very ferocious. We're not very ferocious. We're not very good at, say, up against a mountain lion. <laughs> right. No claws, no teeth. Uh, so... Kind of weak. Uh, kind of weak. This may yet be our downfall, but it's an interesting. Again, it's all it's all it's also some kind of great chain of being bullshit, you know. Mm-hmm. But um, but it it really was a was a neat. It also seems terrible. needlessly theological and and um, full of theological holes. But yeah, yeah. Well, he was that. Okay, I'm going to read another little passage here. Okay, let's hear it. Page 216, this passage illustrates part of White's style that I really like. And it's called, it's a style called uh, bathos, mm-hmm. where you uh, interrupt your writing with what can be dramatic changes of tone from high to low or vice versa. From low to high for comic effect. For comic effect. Wart lay on his back with his bare skin half off him and his hands clasped behind his head. It was too beautiful to sleep, too temperate for the rug. He watched out at the stars in a kind of trance. Soon it would be the summer again when he could sleep on the battlements and watch these stars hovering as close as moths above his face, and in the Milky Way at least with something of the mothy pollen. They would be at the same time so distant that unutterable thoughts of space and eternity would baffle themselves in his sighing breast, and he would imagine to himself how he was falling upward higher and higher among them, never reaching, never ending, leaving and losing everything in the tranquil speed of space. He was fast asleep when Archimedes came for him. Eat this, said the owl, and handed him a dead mouse. (laughs) that's that's an uh, an example of one of white's like turns Turns "Hmm." so in his writing there are these epiphanies that really rival anything i read in joyce right that are just gorgeous and also absolute comedy Mm -hmm. um he parodies songs, he parodies rhymes and verses in popular culture. Mm-hmm. He totally mixes up his timelines. It's there's no coherent time in medieval history when this story takes place. No. He mixes up, you know, like um different uh different royal dynasties Jeez. and all this. <laughs> yeah. How is it? It's it's a, it's a um it's a chronological mess. And, and I think that's intentional. It's intentional. He's like his British school kid who like threw all his notes up in the air and they all came down in a heap and then he rebuilt mm-hmm. the story of King Arthur out of out of all this plus all his popular culture and songs right. and What well, I mentioned a while ago that um he he seems very American. Was he was he like a big gank sympathizer or something? He I think he he did spend time in the U.S. I want to find more of his writings because I've yeah. only got I, I've only read the Sword in the Stone. I've read the Once and Future King and the Book mm-hmm. of Merlin. Mm-hmm. I have another novel by his, but I, I think there's also some nonfiction that I'd like to look at. Yeah, because he seems like a gankophile to me. Yes, yeah, like a uh, an Alexis de Tocqueville kind of. Yeah. Yeah. kind of personage um so uh, to summarize i mean b- basically uh it's superficially a coming of age story there's not a lot of pathos in it Mm-mm. we do get to know this character and every once in a while we see that he's sad or struggling or whatnot mm-hmm. but it's not very like uh it's not in your face 
Mm-mm. You know, you don't like struggle with him. Um, superficially, buildings Roman, but it's also very silly. It's subversive. It's about communism and socialism and all these different cultures and societies that work gets Immersed stuck in, into. But, yeah, I don't think it's actually that subversive. Um, it mixes up these beautiful passages with low humor, songs, parodies, anachronism, accents, a very eclectic vocabulary, mm-hmm. mixes in a lot of Middle English vocabulary mm-hmm. without explaining it ever, right? Just throws it out there. So I actually, uh-huh. I've had to get onto like, um, into my Middle English dictionary to understand some of these terms from Old French, right? Right. Um, this remains one of my favorite books. I'm going to try and reread The Once and Future King to see how that holds up. But that's not a children's story. I mean, the actual story of um, uh, of King Arthur, his whole legend, mm-hmm. is filled with violence and adultery, you know. Yeah, no, that's kind of awful. Yeah. yeah no, so not for kids. That part's not for kids, but this remains an interesting kid's story. Mm-hmm. So, and And it really was a book that touched and moved me. So there it is. And our kids enjoyed it. Our kids did enjoy it. They especially enjoy it when I act it out. Yes. Well, actually, the like boys Like Grumor and Pelinor fighting. Yes, the boys was, really loved it. Because at one point I was running around the room, tripping over things, bellowing, you know. <laughs> yes, I recall so that. That yeah. was pretty funny. Um, okay, so more books upcoming and in progress. I'm reading a small book called Demagoguery and Democracy by Patricia Roberts Miller. This is a very, very short book. It's really just a very small book. It's a small mm-hmm. form. Uh, It's really just a small essay, but it's quite interesting. I'm reading Listen Liberal by Thomas Frank. I'm about a third of the way through that. Uh, I'm reading The Reactionary Mind, second edition, Conservatism from Edmund Burke to Donald Trump, a book of essays by Corey Robin. Uh, Mm -hmm. And for Bedtime Story, we're reading the unabridged, unexpurgated Peter Pan which I have to say is much, much stranger than I remember. It's really weird. It reads like, it's much darker, too. It reads yeah. like something by William Hope Hodgson. It's very dark. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I've, I've never understood it as a, right. I mean, it's clearly a dark story, You're right? real, You're realizing now that you've never read the original. Yeah. You only read like... Uh, abridgments. Abridgments, adaptations. adaptations yeah. And it, and it does come off as a dark story, and you can see that in it. Like just in the 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 main points of the plot, right? Yeah. But uh, it's dark and perverse and a little bit disturbing, actually. <laughs> yeah, and and we're only in the first chapter, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, the first chapter. I don't know if the kids are going to put up with this. It may be too. Well, I I think the the infant and the four year old might. Yeah, bow, bow out. Bow out. Yeah. But the older kids, I think, are there for it. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to wind up this segment on... Um, what you're reading. What you're reading. You got anything you've been reading? Nothing new. Nothing new. No, it takes me so long to read. You so, do. You read slowly, but you read your... the your uh, What is that? The, the grind exceedingly fine? The grind exceedingly... Well, yeah, I, I, I understand everything I read by the time I'm done. By the time you're done. But yeah. you read you do read much slower than you do. But I admire how thoroughly you... You, you practically have a book memorized by the time you're done with it. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, we'll come back and do some more segments today if we can and get up what we can. Yeah, it's the first Sunday of Advent, so there's a lot going on. Okay. Take care, everyone. All right. Till next time.